Well, hi, everyone. Um, welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar titled Concentration and Size of Virus Like. My name is Julie Chen Yuen, and I'm here today. Okay, to address the science and gratitude for your work and dedication in creating a life vaccine in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you. We're in the trenches with you as we play our supportive role um, as scientific instrumentation providers. Okay, so it is my great pleasure today to introduce to you our frequent but popular webinar speaker, Dr. Jeff Bobbycomb. Jeff is our product line manager for particle characterization. He received his PhD in material science and engineering from Rutgers University. He has years of experience focusing on dynamic light scattering, laser diffraction, and image analysis, both in the lab and out in the field. And he is especially interested in sources of error, in measurements, um, scattering techniques, and microscopy. And okay, Jeff, would you please share your screen? I'm going to go ahead and pass the ball to you. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Julie. And as she said, this is Jeff Bodycomb. I'm with Reba Scientific. And today I'm going to be talking about sizing and counting viruses and a few and some kind of virus-like particles. Uh, I'm going to walk through some background, some overview of nanoparticle tracking analysis, and then kind of get into the meat of things with some results. I'll kind of wrap up towards a dis discussion of using fluorescence in these analyses, and then finally close with a few concluding comments. Before I get to that, a quick word from our sponsor, which is Hariba, uh, us. Do you, did you sign up for our email newsletter? I saw about half of you learn about us through email. Uh, if you send us a chat or email your desire to labinfo at hariba.com, uh, that will give us permission to send you uh, send you this email newsletter. We we don't send out permission, and so if you're missing it, it's probably because we, we're not convinced that you really want it yet. So convince us. Okay, thank you. Now on to some background comments on a nano, well, really on nanoparticle analysis. And I'll use the term nanoparticle. Uh, viruses with their size range really fits in with this nanoparticle sizes. So established technology, you, you've probably seen dynamic light scattering, uh, laser diffraction, or called classical nanoparticle tracking analysis, and then transmission electron microscopy. Um, so all those have been kicking around for quite a long time, uh, and they each have their individual strengths and uh, weaknesses. Uh, because I'm interested in the scattering techniques, of course, I'll mention them a little more, in a little more detail. Laser diffraction really looks at particle sizes from tens of nanometers up to a few millimeters, converts the angular variation scattered light into a size distribution. It's fast, it's repeatable, and it's extremely common. You see it for suspensions as well as dry powders. Dynamic light scattering slide was missing, but dynamic light scattering uh, looks at scattering as a function of time, and from that you can extract the size and size distribution works down to sub nanometer size range and goes up to a few microns on a good day. Yes, yeah, so that's, again, it's a very fast repeatable technique. Uh, electron microscopy, as the name says, electron microscope, it's great for actually getting at the shape of the particles because you do collect images and rather than using light, you're using electrons. The advantage, of course, is the shape information and lots of detail. The disadvantage is that you don't see very many particles and sample prep can be a real nosebleed. So kind of what's unmet, visualization on any kind of scale of what's happening to these systems, and then also accurate or producible measurement of your number concentration and some details of size distribution. The technology really relies on Brownian motion. Uh, so we're looking at at the random motion of particles do the thermal motion. It's random, um, I said that about four times, sorry. Uh, it's related to particle size, related to liquid viscosity, and related to temperature. Uh, so generally, people will measure the motion. I'm going to know viscosity, I'm going to know temperature, and from that, extract the particle size. And so 
it's important to keep this in mind because it helps you interpret experimental results and understand what you can and can't do with these sorts of techniques. So in nanoparticle tracking analysis, uh, this shows uh, a light source coming from the left side of the page into this block. I have a is zipping around due to thermal motion. And then towards the bottom right, we have a microscope and a camera that is looking at the scattered light. So it's really kind of like a dark field microscopy approach. And so if the scattered light is really going to tell us where is the particle, you take a videotape and then you will know uh, location versus time and you can extract particle motion. So here's an instrument schematic uh, for a multi-laser system. You have your three lasers, red, green, and blue. Beams are combined, hit the sample. You have a camera at a right angle, and you're looking at the scattering from each of the particles in there. And a little bit later on, I will get into why we use the three lasers. Before I do, I do want to mention something about Brownian motion and these measurements. This is a slide that I actually made years ago for dynamic light scattering, we're looking at particle motion. And so when I report a size by nanoparticle tracking analysis or dynamic light scattering, uh, I'm really reporting this sphere that moves or diffuses the same way as your sample. Uh, so if you have something like a, 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 uh, a, a perfect sphere, then everything's easy. It's pretty easy to think about. If you have something like a coarse shell particle, which I show on the left, then the size is the size of the entire particle. Um, so if you think about a virus as a payload, if you will, and, and then a, a protein coat, we're going to look at the entire thing. And we actually can't tell whether that, that uh, virus particle is hollow or filled. The next is if you have an aggregate. So if I have several particles stuck together, I'm going to just pretend that that lumpy thing is a sphere. And I'm going to report the size of all the particles stuck together. Uh, so I'll mention a little bit later on with some data. Viruses do like to aggregate, and lots of other things like to aggregate. And so start being able to use this as a tool to see aggregate size. And finally, if you have something that's football-shaped or not perfectly spherical, think uh, tobacco mosaic virus, which is very asymmetrical, you're still going to get the size of a sphere that moves like your particle. And so if you keep these things in mind, it helps you interpret your data a lot more clearly than if you uh, kind of stick with some size number that you can just slap a ruler on like you would get with an electron microscope. So all this sounds great, and it's probably time to move into some of the bad news. The bad news is that if I look at scatter intensity as a function of particle size, I make a plot of intensity on the left as a function of diameter, I see that I have about eight orders of magnitude variation in my scattered light with a two order magnitude of variation in particle size. And so what this means is that in DLS, you're going to see a much stronger effect from the larger particles, uh, which will tend to mask the small particles when you start looking at distributions. With classical nanoparticle tracking analysis, you find out that if you set up your system for one particle size, you don't get useful data on other particle sizes. There is also an effect uh, that shows up more in, nan in nanoparticle track analysis than, than DLS, um, which is your volume does depend on the particle size and refractive index. Uh, and so because you have such a strong scattering effect, your effective volumes vary. And I'll get into that in a little bit. This is a fairly well-known problem, ISO 19430. Uh, polydispersity affects the ability to track and therefore analyze different size fractions because the large particles scatter more than the small ones. Now, I mentioned this, I will also, the ISO committee is working on updates to reflect the multi-laser around this issue. So you'll see a change eventually. How do we get around it? Well, basically we cheat. And what we do instead of using a single laser and a camera with a single setup is that we use three different lasers, red, green, and blue. And we have a lower power red, medium power green, and a higher power blue. And with the color video, I have three video streams. So I have all three lasers running simultaneously. 
I have the um, my red stream with the scattering from a weak excitation and the blue with the scattering from a strong excitation. And then I knit the whole thing back together after I analyze the particles. So this video probably illustrates that a little bit better. So in the top, you see kind of a typical video from the view size. I put it in color just to kind of make it look pretty. Uh, the first thing you notice is that we're visualizing particle motion and it's striking how little particles diffuse or freely diffuse uh, or uh, in suspension. So when you start thinking about colloidal uh, suspensions, you might think about them kind of freely zipping around. Particles don't move all that much. And so that's, that was just kind of the first thing that struck me when I got my hands on one of these instruments a couple years ago. Now, if I split the video into three separate streams, my red, green, sorry, I have it reversed, blue, green, and red, you can see that the, uh, the blue, and by the way, saturation is when I have the color completely dark in there. Uh, so you can see that the blue has two small points up here and nothing in the green and nothing in the red. And the reason for that is the blue laser is the highest power. And so I get nice scattering even from the smallest particles in the suspension. But the lower power red doesn't show any scattering from those small particles. If I look down at the bottom, okay, here we go. Um, we're off to the right. You can see these great big blobs here in blue. They're large and they're irregular. Basically, the camera is saturated. And the, the whole name of the game here is find the particle. If I have a large irregular blob, I can't really decide where is the center from frame to frame. So I have poor tracking. As I move to the right and have lower powers, I can see I get nice sharp points in the same areas. And those nice sharp points really make tracking easy. And when you make a computer problem easy, it means you get very good results. And so what we can do is take this three color video, the computer will calculate for particles it finds, which color has the best data and use that to prepare your size distribution. The other is that you notice the data is coming particle, and so you have data from each individual particle, which means you can get very high resolution size distributions. This is a contrast to dynamic light scattering, where uh, you take the data, to really take the light from all the particles in one shot, and then you try to untangle the mess mathematically at the end, uh, which leads to very what is called very low resolution size distribution details in dynamic light scattering, whereas you get much higher resolution with the nanoparticle tracking analysis. So the next thing I want to talk about, so we talked about how to get particle size, is move on to concentration, because that really has come up and we've seen a fair amount of interest in that when people are looking at uh, virus type samples. The challenge is that your observed volume actually depends on the intensity of scattered light. So basically, your observed scattering volume is smaller for small particles that scatter weakly compared to large particles that scatter strongly. And so you do need to do a calibration of targeted volume as a function of particle size. And then once you know that and we have the intensities, we can actually go back and calculate the size distribution correct with the correct scattering volume for each species or each size. This, this slide here actually shows the uh, concept a little bit uh, more easily than the, than the words before. You can think your scattering volume, the laser comes from the left and illuminates this rectangular box. The box edges, so the left side and top side, are defined by the camera optics. And because that length is fairly long, you can treat them as basically sharp edges in intensity. Okay, where you get the trouble, however, is the thickness. Uh, so this is about 50 microns thick. Because of the wave nature of the light and optics and a few other things like reality, we do not have an illumination that's a perfect top hat, like shown with this blue here. So here I apply intensity as a function of thickness. And ideally, I really want that intensity to be just exactly zero or one and nothing in between. What really happens, I intensity in the middle, 
and the lower intensities of the edges. So if you think of a particle that scatters weakly, in order to get enough photons scattered for the, for the uh, camera to see it, it needs lots of intensity. And so that would correspond to this red arrow towards the top where the scattering is quite strong, quite weak, so the required intensity is strong. So the width of my scattering volume is quite narrow. If I take a very large particle that scatters strongly, well, now I don't need so many photons reaching the particle because it's, enough of them will, will move on to the camera to find it, even if the incident beam intensity is quite low. And so the larger particle effective volume will have a thickness that corresponds to this uh, longer red dimension arrow towards the bottom. And then there's kind of a nominal volume in between, which I mentioned. Okay, so that's really the, the concentration. So there are two pieces in here um, that are pretty important. The first, of course, going back is the particle by particle analysis and the ability to do it over a wide range of particle sizes. The second is getting the correct concentration. And because the instrument works with broad size distributions, which come up a whole lot, then this sort of correction is desirable and probably necessary. I, I've never investigated if it, it's required for the narrow distributions to actually work on a single laser system. That's a question for a different day. So what we do is we basically create plots of effective volume as a function of particle diameter. Those ship with the software. And so we have some recommended conditions for various materials. Uh, in registration, somebody asked me about instrument operation. This is, and so I want to go ahead and add a few slides to cover that. The instrument has samples in cuvette. So you have an insert, a cuvette. I put this, I left a stir bar inside for the photo because white stir bars and white backgrounds just don't look good. Put the insert into the cuvette. Now you're ready and you load the sample with a, with a pipetter or a dropper, generally a pipetter. Then you stuff the cuvette into the analyzer shown here, and then you'll press record in the software and away you go. Uh, the whole process takes about 15 minutes. So and depending on what you're used to, it can be a very fast measurement or it's, although it's slower than DLS. At the end, of course, you like to clean everything up. So what you can do with the view sizer and the cuvette assemblies is you can take it apart and separate it for thorough cleaning. So a cleaning procedure in a BSL2 lab is often you'll, you'll empty it out, you'll take it apart, it will find its way into bleach, and then you'll uh, go through cleaning steps to remove the, the bleach, then remove whatever cleaning liquid you, you used, and it's ready for use again. Because we can take it apart, because it's robust materials, we have a lot of cleaning options. I have done, well, soaking in bleach I mentioned. Uh, I know someone that uses a water pick. That comes up more often with, with protein aggregates, which tend to be sticky, gooey messes. Ultrasonic baths work as well. And the reason I mention cleaning so much is that cross-contamination is an issue with these samples. You have very low particle concentrations. And the cleaner your glassware is, the better your, your results. And if you have a system that is, you have to kind of flow a lot and with dead spots, you're just, it's just not gonna clean up. Let's move on to some practical results. We'll start with kind of the least virus-like of, of the materials I'm gonna show, which is uh, nano gold. And I'm showing this because I have some data comparing it with dynamic light scattering and versus the multi-laser nanoparticle tracking analysis. The red spikes correspond to the samples as they were prepared. And then you have the green graphs correspond to dynamic light scattering results, and the blue graphs correspond to nanoparticle tracking analysis results. And so if you start in upper left graph, you have a combination of 50 and 100 nanometer nanogold, and dynamic light scattering shows you a single peak. Nanoparticle tracking analysis does resolve that into two separate peaks, so you actually see the higher resolution of this measurement. Now, if you've been doing dynamic light scattering for a while, you know that you certainly can resolve bimodal samples if they are, if certain conditions are met. And those are met really in the center graph. So here I have a lot of the smaller nanogold particles and then some, some larger ones and well separated in size. And I can baseline resolve 
these two peaks by dynamic light scattering. Well, it's come as no surprise that multi-laser nanoparticle tracking analysis does that as well. So it's really, you'll see the difference and in the more relevant case to the left where the peaks are cl closer in size. Moving to the right, uh, you'll see a mixture of three different size gold samples. And after decades of dynamic light scattering work, I've seen one claim where someone claim, said that they could resolve a trimode. I'm not really sure I believe it. And so anyway, once again, we couldn't do it with DLS. However, with the nanoparticle tracking analysis, we could resolve all three peaks in the size distribution. Moving on to something that is a lot more biological is really NIST has an effort to simulate a protein aggregate mixture. And they're, and they're using some synthetic materials in order to uh, give it good lifetime and so on. And so this, these are some results from that study where I show density of size distribution on the left as a function of particle diameter. And it's a mixture of one, two, three, four particle sizes with a somewhat broad distribution each. And my concentrations really are over about three decades, about one e to the four to one e to the seven particles per ml per nanometer. That last nanometer is because I normalize by bin width. And so this is points to uh, what kind of resolution we can get with the more weakly scattering materials that you're gonna encounter in biological work. And so gold, if, if you've ever seen it, it scatters very nicely. It's a great place to start, but we really wanna keep our focus on the more weakly scattering uh, materials that are more interesting. Okay, so if I talk about uh, viruses, let's go to um, our old friend tobacco mosaic virus, which has shown up in the DLS literature for decades now. I show a single frame from a video, and the points are corresponding to scattering from individual virus particles and aggregates. So tobacco mosaic virus is kind of bigger. You see a size about 200 nanometers. And then what you'll see is a tail off to the right of aggregate species. So this is a reminder that yes, viruses do aggregate, aggregate, and you can see that in the size distribution. Another thing to point out is that I'm actually extracting particle concentrations. If you ever try to do it with DLS, you'll find out that your concentration is very, very sensitive to the size distribution you pull out. And because of a very irritating fact of the statistics of scattering, the weighting that you would need to use for DLS size distribution doesn't work for backing out concentrations. And so your errors just kind of explode pretty quickly. Uh, here, by counting particle by particle, I don't have those sorts of problems. And so I can get reliable concentration results. Uh, moving on to livestock, which has been important to humanity for millennia and certainly still important to me. This is off of livestock virus that it was used for some vaccine work. Uh, again, single frame from video. Here we see them a lot of finer points. And then I have a size distribution. Again, I have a peak now of somewhat smaller size, and I see a larger number of aggregates. My parent particle concentration is a bit higher than the previous one that I showed with tobacco mosaic virus. Given that there's completely different kinds of viruses, uh, there isn't much to be said about that in terms of concentration. I didn't want to do a comparison between two viruses where I just overlay the cumulative plots to show you, hey, that we are getting different answers for different materials. Uh, so tobacco mosaic virus, I plot the cumulative size distribution on the left axis, and then the livestock virus I have on the right axis, and you can see that the tobacco mosaic virus is larger, say, uh, here I start seeing a peak at uh, 150 or so, and it's finer for the livestock virus. Okay, so I went to Europe last year, and for, for a few things, Part of it was vacation, and I come home and tell everybody this is my favorite picture from the uh, from the trip. And I'm not sure that made me very popular with the family, but this was really a screenshot from analysis of a purified human viral vector. Uh, so this was a virus used for gene. Well, I'm not sure if it's being used for gene therapy or being developed for gene therapy, but somehow in that gene therapy space. So anyway, I thought it was just a great photo. So I'm going to share. Hopefully, you appreciate it more than my family did. And I'm going to overlay a couple size 
I'm going to overlay the size distribution from a couple samples and look at two different ways. The first is to look at the size distribution of the harvest and then take it after a purification step. And what you can really see, so I took my units off the left because they are, we'll get to that about the units in the next slide, uh, but I want to normalize them and you can really see that the, the harvested material has a much broader size distribution than after purification. Now, of course, part of that is the impurities brought in from the harvest, and part of it is the virus production itself. So we'll talk about that briefly afterwards. Now, the next part of the story is, well, gee, I, I made the size distribution a little bit more narrow. What else happened? Well, here's where plotting uh, my concentration in actual concentration units, particles per ml per nanometer, shows me that this purification uh, significantly increased the particle concentration, as well as narrowing the particle size. And so they, I guess on the, on the larger particle size, you know, it almost looks like a dewatering step. Obviously it's not, but when you look at something like this, you, you say, okay, I took away a whole bunch of, uh, of dispersion. And so that purification kind of did two jobs. And so this really points to how the multi-laser nanoparticle tracking analysis can help you keep score in your virus manufacturing. Another thing I want to point out is that as you look at these plots, and you probably noticed, let's go back to this one a little bit more easily here, that these size distributions are not ridiculously sharp. And so if you kind of think about viruses, you think, you know, my biology book kind of said they were all the same size, and well, measurement says they aren't. I'll talk about that in a second, why it's so wide. I want to move on to infectious titers first, oh, one more perfect comment. When you're looking at virus production, you're interested in infectious titers. Well, how active is the virus? Uh, you can do a viral plaque ass assay, which is time-tested. It uh, really makes a lot of sense why people like it. Um, it's fairly inexpensive. It is fairly effective and relevant. It's also time-consuming and really depends on the user and some manual counting steps. Uh, quantitative PCR is expensive, it's accurate for what it measures, and it requires uh, virus-specific primers. It really tracks DNA or RNA, not the entire, not lot active virus particles. In the plaque assay, basically you'll, you'll serial dilute your virus, and you'll infect a plate of, of really spread out cells, and you'll incubate. That's a nice word for saying you'll wait around which if you like to wait around is great, and if you have time is great. Uh, you'll stop the diffusion of the virus, and you'll count the number of dead cells, groups of dead cells for each dilution. So this is a pretty simple process. You just drop some material in there, go away, come back in a while, count the dead spots. There's some drawbacks. One is user user variability. So I'm not gonna agree with Julie on what, it, what is a dead spot versus spread cells. And not all viruses cause drastic disruption to cell morphology or cell death. It's a fancy way of saying you can't always tell when the virus has infected a cell or has infected its neighbors. And so that also makes the process a little bit more arduous. If I can get virus concentrations, I can actually plot a correlation, my titer platform units, and my particle count. So basically, you can start generating these lines where you say, hey, the more particles I count in 15 minutes is going to predict what I can get in several days by my titers. And there's a pretty good correlation. It turns out to rely on looking at all the, you know, the larger species in uh, the sample, not just the uh, single virus particles. Okay. Now we can talk about why we're seeing a broad distribution and some other things that we see in these samples. You kind of start with a textbook, or really this is a Wikipedia image of virus production. The virion enters the, enters the cell, it uses the cell to reproduce, and then the cell sheds virus particles or falls apart and releases virus particles. It, it's a great story and it, you know, kind of intuitively appealing. Turns out the cells don't particularly like making viruses. And so you're going to see chunks that are partial virus, uh, you're going to see aggregates to come out. And so to get these titers, you need a range of sizes. 
It's kind of shown schematically here where I have a cell spitting out the particles and I really expect to see some aggregates. And these aggregates are also infectious. You will get some virus particles that do not come with DNA or RNA. And that also means they're not going to be particularly infectious. And you're going to get broken virus particles where they form kind of half a particle or there's bits of coat missing or something. So really your virus production is gonna give you a wide range of particle sizes. And then as you're trying to keep score, you're gonna to need to analyze this wide size range. And that's where you're gonna need the multiple lasers and now the particle tracking analysis. Okay, so now we've covered viruses. I'm gonna move on to a couple of virus-like particles. The first one I thought of, when well, I think about this was kind of exosomes. So these are human exosomes at concentration about 60 to 7 particles per ml after dilution, average size 150 nanometers. Again, I'm seeing the uh, size distribution. I'm seeing a broad distribution, which is typical of these materials. And you look at the size power, they look much like viruses. You put them in your body. Well, they're your, your own exosomes. They certainly don't behave like viruses, but they, for the analysis side, they look very similar. A somewhat less benign example is protein aggregation. There's an example I like to show when I talk about proteins because I want to show the negative case as well as the positive. This is lysozyme heated to 60 degrees C. The negative, which is uh, just PBS buffer that I use for the experiment, I don't have any particles to speak of. If I measure lysozyme or any monomeric protein, I pretty much see nothing. Those molecules are just too small and they don't scatter strongly enough to be seen with nanoparticle tracking analysis. Of course, you can see them and analyze them by a static and dynamic light scattering. It's by static light scattering, I mean like a molecular weight analyzer, because you're looking scattering from many, many molecules at the same time. However, if I heat my lysozyme to 60C, I start at aggregation, then my videos start to look like a night sky, lots and lots of spots, lots of particles. So I have aggregation, I can see those and count them quite readily. At the bottom, I've shown graphs. I actually told my software to graph the, the lysozyme in PBS and the PBS only, and you can't even see it. I should have just left it alone. And then in the blue, I have the heated material. You'd see my number distribution of aggregation on the left graph, and cumulative on the right side of that. And then if I can convert that to a volume-based distribution, notice that I have a fairly significant number of aggregates by volume. They're quite large, even though they're not significant by uh, number. So one thing is that if I'm looking at uh, size distributions, to look at the number distribution and convert to volume is much easier and less sensitive to error than going the other way. That's some other, another advantage of the analyzer. Now, protein aggregates are interesting, and I claim they're virus-like. And the first point, of course, is that they scatter much like viruses. And the second and much more irritating point is that if you're manufacturing a protein therapeutic, these protein aggregates will provoke an immune response, and that is a virus-like behavior. Physiologically, you kind of don't like them very much either. So that's how they fit in with the virus-like, both in scattering and in behavior. Moving on to the last topic is, I want to talk a little bit about the fluorescence analysis options. I'll show you this over normal measurement mode with my three lasers, and then I have the sample and the video camera with no filter. I could just use that for making an analysis. Well, let's say I turn off my green and my red lasers, just leave the blue on, and I put in a filter to block the blue light, and so I only see light with a longer wavelength than the excitation. Well, how can I make that happen is with fluorescence. So if I, can, if I have a mixture of fluorescing material and non-fluorescing material, I can detect which materials fluoresce and ignore all those that do not. Uh, this doesn't come for free. There's some significant method development challenges in here. Photo bleaching, which really means that you have less fluorescent intensity due to overexposure of the fluorophore. We minimize that by pulsing the lasers in sync with the camera. And so we have less energy going into the system. We allow you to adjust laser power levels individually. So you can turn down laser so there's fewer photons reaching it. In the measurement process, we stir to randomly bring up a batch of samples. So we have a fresh aliquot, and we do that repeated times. And so we're working with unbleached material more often. 
And if you, if you just need concentration, you can actually cut the measurement short to find particle concentration and have less resolution on your size, uh, size analysis. Detection limits, it's really a question of how much fluorescent material can you attach to or include in your particle, which partially comes down to particle size. So this is very application specific. And so do you have a very robust, uh, can you attach enough of it to each individual particle? Again, because we're looking at things particle by particle, you find out that you're always fighting for that last photon. Once it all works, uh, there's some cool games you can play. I'll give you a couple examples with some polystyrene beads labeled and unlabeled. This is a mixture, and in the gra top graph in black, I show a measurement. I see two nice peaks at 150 nanometer and at 300 nanometers. And then if I go down here and do a the untagged 300 nanometer material is invisible. I don't see it. If I mix, say, three diameters of beads, then I can see my overall size distribution has one, two, three peaks. So that gives you a hint of my resolution. 100 nanometers, this is 140 nanometers. So that's how close the peaks can get and still resolve them. And if I put the filter in, so I just find the Fluoromax beads at 140, the other two populations simply disappear, and I get the analysis that I'm looking for. I could also mix two beads with different excitation emission uh, spectra, and then make three measurements. I see the total in black, I see the green fluorescent in green, and the blue fluorescent in blue, and everything adds up. So even though they're the same size, I can actually separate out the species. Okay, so some concluding comments about all this. Uh, first, let me talk about the disadvantages. And nothing comes for free, if you will. The measurement itself is slow. So by the time you take the video and process, you're looking at about 15 minutes per sample. And if you look at dynamic light scattering, you're looking at a few minutes, and laser diffraction, you're looking at a minute per sample. So it's much slower than other scattering techniques. A lot of that can be traced back to this idea that you're only taking light from one particle from each individual particle. We don't get morphology analysis. So you can visualize kind of what's happening in your colloidal suspension, but you don't have an idea of your particle shape the way you would get with transmit with TEM. And then you do need to dilute the sample significantly. And in some applications, this is a concern. Uh, so we run at very, very low particle concentrations, even compared to dynamic light scattering. The advantages, aside, I should mention size range. I forget if I mentioned later. I write 10 nanometers to 40 microns, and that is material dependent, really looking for something like a virus at about 60 nanometers to a few microns as a reasonable size range. So again, that gold nanoparticles, I can, yeah, I can go down real small, but very few viruses are made of gold. Now, the big advantages of nanoparticle tracking analysis, particle concentration, really can't get that well with scattering. A good reputation, representation of the particles throughout the whole size range. I can really see everything that's happening in my sample. I can count particles that couples back to concentration. I can get some extra information on kinetics, particularly the number of, of, of particles I have that I can't get so readily otherwise. Uh, fluorescence, uh, no calibrations required. I visualize what's happening in the sample. And I should have written it down, but high resolution size distributions is a big advantage of this. Kind of key benefits, fundamentally all rests on the fact that individual particle method and that we work with uh, broad size distributions. Quick rundown of specs. I guess the only one that's important at this discussion is the minimum sample volume is about 400 microliters. Uh, most of the samples I've encountered, I wind up diluting down, so sample quantity has not been limiting. It likes to live in a typical uh, laboratory environment. Please don't put this in your uh, in a shed in a in an oil refinery. Yeah, but other than that, you're good. A picture of the instrument sits on your bench top, and to the right is a cuvette with a somewhat different style insert than the one I photographed. So in summary, this is big change in uh, nanoparticle characterization technology. Uh, gets me high resolution distribution, particle concentrations. Really, there's been a great working with this coming out of dynamic light scattering laser diffraction, like I have. You can do a whole lot more than than you could otherwise.
And here I'll say thank you. I'll remind you about our newsletter, and then I'm going to uh, get ready for some questions. Thank you, Jeff, um, for the excellent webinar. I want to address that, you know, this and also all of our webinars are recorded and they'll be posted on our website so you and your colleagues can access it anytime at your convenience without logging in. And then we will go ahead and move on to the Q&A session. So question one, the virus is assumed as a separate particle as embedded in the bacterial cell. Is that true? Um, oh, okay. So uh, when I analyze the viruses, they've already been separated from the cells. Uh, so even even the, the measurement after harvest, before any other purification, they, the the cells have already shed these virus particles. I I don't see anything in the samples that look like whole cells. And so if they're if they're still embedded in the cells, we really can't do much with in terms of analysis. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. The next question is: Does every view sizer comes with three lasers? Yes. Great. Thank you. So you don't pick and choose. So I hope that answers your question. Now the next question is, I work with nanoparticles called cubosomes. They can present very square particle, a uh, square shape. So the measurement for the hydrodynamic size would be a sphere that represents the motion of my square nanoparticles. Yes, that exactly. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm the kind of guy who just pretends everything is a sphere. Figure out the old chem engineering problem of cooking a Thanksgiving turkey, you model it as a sphere. That's me. If it's a cube, I still pretend it's a sphere. Love it. It's simplified and well explained. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Someone next question yeah. How to prepare a sample when starting with an aerosol? Okay, if you have an aerosol, so we're working with particles in liquid suspension. And if I had particles in air, the viscosity of air would be too low and the diffusion would be too fast for me to keep track of. So if you had, if you want to look at droplets in the air, you would have to look at other sizing techniques to get the particle size. You would probably look at some, something like a diffraction technique. If you had an aerosol containing virus particles, you would gather up enough of the aerosol, possibly on a filter, and then probably dilute it with buffer and measure it in that way. Yeah, and then, and then it's gonna get to question the concentration, but I think, yeah, you'll probably need a fair number of aerosol particles to make it work, but you could you could gather them up and, and analyze it like that. So some sample preparation is needed. Yeah, yeah, um, methods, yeah, yeah. Could you use MTA, multi-laser MTA, to analyze for viral prep, which contains both viral vectors, about 80 to 120 nanometers, and exosomes, bra ranges from 30 to 3,300 nanometers, could you use um, that to analyze? Yeah, so sure. if you had yeah, if you had the mixture and you weren't able to tag tag your particles, then you would see the sum of the two particle concentrations. Okay, so if if most of your exosomes are in that I see you right in the fifty to seventy nanometer range, then you could probably just ignore everything below seventy five nanometers, and then you're gonna have some interference between the two populations. It would take a bit of work, but I think you can sort everything out. Uh, if you were able to add a fluorescent tag to the species of interest, whether it's the exosome or the virus, uh, that could help you significantly. And this is certainly the question that if you need more explanation details, you can email us at labinfo at um, yeah. Moving on to, we have quite a bit of questions, and that's a good thing. And so I'm, I'm going to move on to the next. What are the most likely applications with this technique? Was it environmental or is it clinical? Okay, so most of where we've seen this used has been in manufacturing and formulation. Um, I haven't seen a lot of environmental work yet. Uh, we have a couple of analyzers doing it, environmental work for uh, very small microplastics, if you will. And then you ask about clinical, I, nothing, nothing is being used clinically. There's no FDA approval or for, for something like that. So. I, I wouldn't expect to see this in a doctor's office anytime soon. Okay, thank you. Has any view sets ever been used in the COVID-19 analysis? Not that I know of. Got it. Yeah. Um, does NTA give different information from 
NTA measurements. Oh, the multi-laser NTA gives different information from traditional NTA measurements. If yes, are they complementary information? Yes, so the answer is yes, and, and that's the easy part. The, the next thing is that really, single laser NTA is giving you a subset of the information you get with the multi-laser NTA. So what you'll tend to get with the single laser NTA is just a fairly narrow range of the particles in your suspension. And so if you have a broad size distribution, which is pretty typical, you have distorted information about particles that are outside the optimal range for that instrument setup. So for example, you could set your NTA up and turn your camera gain all the way up to 11 to see the smallest particles. And then your data, you won't really have data on the large particles in that same mixture. Conversely, if I turn my camera gain down on my single laser system, I can't find the small ones. Uh, so really the multi-laser lets you see the whole distribution. Thank you. And that's related to the next question, which this person had asked about the virus and exosome. And how do we optimize these lasers? Um, okay, so the, the software, lets you set each laser power individually, lets you set the camera gain separately, and set the exposure time or frame rate in separately. So you can, you can change all these. In truth, what I do in practice is we have a handful of recipes or, or really conditions, and I pick from one of those. Because we have three different laser powers, you're not trying to find the laser power that fits your particle size. So for example, if you hand me a protein aggregation sample, I'll pick that because you can see lots of different sizes in those. I'm gonna pick one set of conditions and I use the same conditions whether my protein aggregates are 80 nanometers, 180 nanometers, or 580 nanometers. I, I, I don't have to change the recipe for either one. I just pick the recipe for things that scatter like proteins. Uh, the same for viruses. We, I'll run TMV the same way I run, uh, well TMV, because of the rotation might be a little bit different, but I'll, I'll run, say, that uh, livestock virus the same way I'll run that human uh, viral vector sample. There's some difference in size. It doesn't really matter. The recipe still works, and that's because if my sample doesn't work for one laser in the recipe, it's going to work for a different one. It, it's just a worrying about what laser setup works for that particular uh, scattering power refractive index. So I'll have a separate reci recipe for synthetic polymers because they scatter more strongly than biological materials. I hope that answers the question in terms of, of method development instrument setup. I think so, and I'm sure that it's sample dependent as well. So, uh, yeah, it, it is. It is. It's just. It, it, I just want to remind people. It, it turns out to be much less sample dependent than you think at first. Um, and, and and maybe I'm repeating that because I was surprised. Um, so, sorry. Maybe intuitive for others. Okay, go on. <laughs> All right. Can you use different filters? for fluorescence, and question two, is the laser auto-focusing? Oh, the camera, uh, is there auto-focusing? Okay, so you can use different filters, and so, and in fact, we designed a system so that you can use a, a fairly common filter size, so if you if you don't like the wavelengths we have, you just put in different ones, we, and you know, that's fine with me. And so, in terms of the system focus, uh, what when you start the system up, it will go to a default focus, and that works a hefty fraction of time. But if I have a system that's lost, I do have to manually focus. This question is related to the QVED. What is the insert needed for? Okay, so the insert's needed really for a couple things. The first is that I want to, I want to stop particle motion, that, so that I'm primarily looking at diffusion of the particle and I have no bulk flow. If you have bulk flow and you try and do nanoparticle tracking analysis, you're very quickly going to run into a mathematical wall. And you can either ignore it, uh, which leads to bad news and surprises, or you can face it, which leads to you knowing your bad news. So that insert is there to stop the flow. It also takes up volume, so we need less liquid for the measurement. And it's also used to help the stirring so that when you stir, you do get fresh batches of particle every time. Thank you. Um, I think that's about it for now. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Um, no, I think, I think we're set, and I'm, uh, 
yeah, I'm running out of time anyway, as you know. So, okay, well, I, I think whatever else came in, we'll, we'll answer offline. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I mean, I do see a lot of questions coming in, and I do want to honor us this time as well. So, again, please feel free to email us at lapinfo at hariba.com along with your questions or feedback. And for now, have a great day, stay safe, and we'll see you at one or more of our future webinars. Thank you, yes, everyone. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.